and welcome to Your Money, Your Call, Bonds versus Equities. Today we'll be focusing on the great rotation. Um, stay tuned, we've got some great questions and we've got a great show for you tonight. I have Chris Joy, he is here for us as a guest. He is a columnist with the Australian Financial Review and he's also on, he's a director of Yellow Brick Road. I have Roger Montgomery who is here from Montgomery Invest. Welcome gentlemen, how are you? If you can be part of the show, please call us on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email us at your money at skynews.com.au. And as I said, I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities. Welcome, guys. How are you? Good. Well, thanks. Um, I, I wanted to start with the theme that this great rotation, that the, the, when I was on holidays, I came back and all of a sudden there's been, a, there's been an event. We've moved, everyone's moved out of cash. They've forgotten all about the bad news of the equity markets and they're all rolling into it. And I suppose, that if I can start with you, Roger, the idea of the great rotation and, and I, I don't know if I'm paraphrasing PIMCO, I, I don't know whether they came up with the term, I know that when they came up with the new normal everyone used it, so I don't want to, you know, I'm not making a disclaimer, but it might have been them. The great rotation, is it real? What do you think it is? Okay. And, and how do you think the investors should consider it? What's here's actually an interesting, happening? And, and here's an interesting one, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to wish that I hadn't said this right at the top of the show. Right. Um, but I think there's, there hasn't been a great rotation at all no one left equities to begin with. Right. And in fact, when you look at the stats, most of the stats and the PIMCO, PIMCO side of these stats as well, when you look at um, data and the level of funds in mutual funds in the United States, you see that there's been a substantial decline. There's been outflows from mutual funds in US equity funds. But to compensate that, and what nobody's citing, is the fact that there's been a, a compensating increase in ETFs, exchange traded funds. Oh. So money's coming out of equity mutual funds and it's going into ETFs. So on a net basis, there actually hasn't been an exit from equity funds. Having said that though, the amount, the proportion invested in equities versus bonds has been shifting overall. But it hasn't been as dramatic as it looks when you just look at the mutual fund outflows. I mean, I, I was reading the, uh, the PIMCO outlook, Bill Gross's outlook for, uh, for February. And, and just remember this though, Mark. He doesn't always get it right. No. Everyone reads it and everyone listens to it. But, you know, they've been calling, there's, a, there's been the call about, sorry to cut across here, but there's been a call for a bond crash since 2009 every single year. So that's five years in a row. Correct. In January every year they've called a bond crash and it hasn't happened. And now, this could be the year it does. That's right. And it, but he, said, he did the mea culpa and he said, I didn't get Treasuries right. You know, that's and right, he yeah. admitted that he then had to go along and he changed his view. So, and, but he, is a, he, is a, he does move policy. He does talk and people do listen. So he mm -hmm. does have effect what people are saying. And, and I think the point that he was making in the recent outlook was his concerns about the debt markets in general. His concern was around the fact that, and it's more the US, his concern was around the fact that you had to put so much into the US now in debt to get any movement in GDP. So you're flogging that horse and you have to hit it harder and harder with the form of debt. And so his, his perspective was, we, we aren't getting the risk rewards that we should get mm. for the amount of debt. I mean, what do you think about the idea that well, the, we're not getting the bank for our bucks? And to oh, Chris's well, point, we're going into other assets well, to the, try the, and get the, that. The, there's been a, I think there's been a bubble in cash, but that's a reflection not of the fact that the returns are attractive, but a reflection of the fact that everything everyone was scared of every other asset. Mm -hmm. So whether it was commodities or currencies or hard assets um, or equities, people were afraid to invest in anything other than cash. So even though they were getting negative real returns, um, they were happy to stick their money under the bed, so to speak, and yeah. shove it into the mattress. Um, that will change, and this year is probably the year that that'll start to shrink. Right. Think about treasuries. You know, treasuries are yielding two-fifths of zero. Um, and Very politely put there. I yeah, thank you very much. I, re I realise I'm not at home. I'm Clearly on TV. Not. Clearly so, not. Um, uh, but, but the reality is people think treasuries are safe. What could be riskier than being guaranteed to lose purchasing power? You know, oh. There's nothing that's more risky. You're 100% guaranteed to lose purchasing power. Uh, we've had an email. It's from Timothy Rides. Uh, As an active investor, is inflation something I should be concerned about? Uh, can you we start with, yeah. with you on Look, the inflation? I'm concerned firstly, I think I don't know a single thing that I have bought that has gone up 3 or 4%. Right. Everything I buy goes up much more than that. And the only reason the official rate of inflation is low is because it includes things that we don't buy as frequently. Mm -hmm. So you get deflation in electronic goods, you get deflation in, uh, in TVs um, and, and laptops and all that sort of stuff. But you buy those once every three years. Yep. 
Right? What the stuff that you're buying every day and the stuff you're buying every year seems to go up by more. Now that might not be true for somebody who has three children. It might not be true for somebody who's retired or somebody who's you know on holidays around the world. But for me, my inflation rate is much higher. Yeah. So I think inflation does matter, and the whole point of investing, the whole point of investing is to lay down some dollars today in the expectation that you're going to get more dollars than what you laid down in the future. And the more dollars you can get, the better. And the reality is that if we go to a restaurant today, there's a certain restaurant that we can afford to go to. The fear is that inflation means that in five or ten years time we can no longer afford to go to that restaurant. So we've got to preserve our purchasing power. And I think and if you're travelling internationally, if you think that when you retire you're going to be going overseas, you've got to preserve your, your purchasing power globally. So that means thinking about the currency as well. So I think inflation is important. The whole, my whole job is to beat inflation for our investors and make sure that their, their standard of living goes up rather than being maintained or going down. And would you agree? Is that, is that the sort of thing you'd be looking for, that well, the RBA and, and the board members to be a little bit more reticent and not being as public in what they do? No, look, I actually don't believe that that's going to ultimately make any difference at all long term. I think it affects, I think it fe affects short term movements in markets, but over time markets will move with valuations and interest rates act like, uh, like gravity. So the higher interest rates go, and, and, and we were talking a moment ago about the inverse relationship between bond prices and bond yields, um, but the reality is that that's true of every asset. Property is the same, shares are the same, business valuations are exactly the same. The higher interest rates go, the lower those valuations, and I think long term, prices follow value. Uh, yeah. So it won't have an impact short term. Uh, sorry, it won't have an impact long term. Right. I, going back to my original premise about having this great rotation theme, one, t two things I'd want to bring to your attention. One is when I was talking about the term deposit rates, if you can get 10% from a Suncorp on a term deposit rate five years ago, a lot of people put a lot of money into those term deposits, which of course are now coming due. Sure. And so they're now reinvesting at 4%. And five years ago it was Westpac, you know, Westpac Correct. term deposits. Westpac term you know, deposits. 5%. The, the rates that they were doing. And so the idea that the banks are trying to recalibrate expectations for the person who's buying a term deposit, you should expect a lot lower rate. You know, you, you used to be able to arbitrage different... Um, branches, mm. the one bank. That doesn't happen anymore, so that's all gone. So rates are much lower for a deposit holder, having come off a 10% into a 5 And I feel that the professional money managers sort of could see that happening, and that's where you started to see that rally in the banks and started to see that rally in Telstra. Mm. I mean, am I getting that completely wrong? It's just that combination no, you're of absolutely right. the deposit market maturing and, and fund managers saying, well, hello, you know, they'll need dividends. Well, we saw, we've seen a big uptick in uh, inflows in our business, and that's a result of people coming back from holidays. Their term deposits have matured. They've looked at what they can get, and they've said, forget that. I'm not. <laughs> it used to be the case that if you saved a million dollars, you were rich. Yeah. And now you've got a million dollars. You've worked hard your whole life. You put it in a term deposit. You're going to earn thirty-five or forty thousand dollars a year. That doesn't seem very rich. It, and so it, people are looking for higher. Are you gear. and we've got a caller right now, Chris from Melbourne. Hello, Chris. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just ringing up about the bonds held by QBE. Everyone talks about them being hostage to the bond market and the low interest rates they're getting at the moment. Um, are they able to just like dump them all at once or do they have to r wait till some sort of maturity and then they'll lose a whole lot of money as the bonds come down and as the interest rates go up? Um, do you want to answer that one or I've got a view on that one. You can go first. It, it's QBE has been very conservative. What they do is they, they take the premium, so they look to insure people, and it's, it's the classic story with an insurance company. You're effectively uh, taking on a liability that you might have to pay out, but in advance of that, you look to make a, a, an investment. So you look to make, Buffett calls it the sweep that you'd like to make or the cash flow that you'd like to make. QBE being very conservative by short-dated US treasuries. And the, the problem for that was that the, that curve well, is zero. They're also required to under the, they're, they're under, required the to. under the legislation. They have to, and it has to be kept in the country where they're providing the insurance. Correct. Um, so, so that's why. Uh, the, the big issue, of course, is that um, well, the benefit for them is if interest rates start going up. Yeah. You know, and so they've been suffering. And if you look at the intrinsic value as well as the price of QBE over the last seven years, it's been declining steadily. Um, and the reason that's been the case is we've had this zero, this ZERP situation in the US. So they haven't been generating uh, any returns on their bonds. 
Uh, that will change. It will change dramatically. When it does change, you'll also see the Aussie dollar come off against the US dollar. So they'll get the benefit of the transfer um, back to Australian dollars. Yep. Uh, and their profits can go through the roof very quickly. And but but people have been calling it every year. That's right. And it hasn't happened. And one of the things that they continue to do is expand into the United States. And if you're in the United States, the insurance world is quite different from the rest of the world in that it's regulated by a state base. So it, it's a pyramid system. So the states dominate. I need to be compliant with the state legislation. And then I go to the federal. Mm -hmm. So when AIG went under, you'd go to AIG Insurance and said, oh, you know, give me all that money. Well, they, they said, well, you've got to go to the New York Fed. You've got to go to the New York insurer mm -hmm. to approve the movement of the transfer of this money because the greatest concern from all these regulators is no one will pay out a life insurance policy. So QBE is the same. They need to be compliant with whatever US domicile they're working with, whatever state. And so that means buy short-dated bonds because they're very safe. In, in the perspective of the US is that they're very safe and so therefore the returns are weak. So you're right. It's, it's, it, they're, they're unique in the sense that they invest. They don't invest in equities. It's only in, in short-dated short bonds. That's right. So, um, the safe haven. Yeah, and, and that's, that's really helped them. Um, you know, that's really, when, when around them a lot of insurance companies go bust yeah. uh, as a result of, you know, as a result of catastrophes, um, they've done very, very well. Um, so people think they haven't, of course, because they look at the share price and it's been diabolical. Uh, mm. But eventually the cycle will change and the premium cycle will change as well. And premiums will start going up as there's less competition. Risk, yep. and Chris, the reason why it's hard to cover your cost of living is because as you earn more, you spend more. Yes, <laughs> yes <that's true. laughs> People that are aspirational. Right. They always want more than they've got. And I think we had the, uh, the, did we have the chart of the equity there for the Sydney Airport? I mean, I, I think that's one of the things you'd like to try and consider. Do I buy... Okay, so there's, there's the chart of the actual underlying equity. So do I buy the equity or do I buy the debt? Or, you know, I would offer the thoughts that if you like Sydney Airport, it's, it is a bit monopoly. If you like the monopoly trading strategy, you might look to say, let's have part of both. Let's have a little bit of the equity or a little bit of the, um, and the debt. And it might give... The thing that was very obvious to me was just the volatility in the performance. It's up yeah. and down, it's up and down. Look, and that's, that's a real concern for an investor sure. that might be watching this show. Sure. Professionals might be different. Yeah, no, I, well, I, 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 the, your point's made. Uh, I just, I'm just concerned that that chart was such a microscopic view. Um, you know, it's, it was one year rolling, of rolling annual returns. And you know, had we gone back five years or ten years, a very different picture might have might have might have transpired. Um, having said that, though, whether you, when you're buying equities, you need to do something um, that most people don't do. Um, what typically happens is uh, you, people treat treat the stock market as a place to trade stocks, and so they tend to buy stocks yeah. in the, and betting that they'll go up in price. Uh, and that's the same as betting on black or red at the casino. Um, you need to approach stocks as if you're buying businesses. Uh, and if you buy a great business, you're going to make a lot more money over time yep. um, than, I think, uh, than buying bonds, particularly at this time of the cycle. We can because talk about that, but we've got Carl from Melbourne on the okay, phone. So, no Carl, can you uh, feel free to chat? Oh, hi, Mark, and uh, thanks to, uh, to you and the panel for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions. One, a very quick and very naive um, question because I'm, I'm fairly new to bonds uh, and one about uh, strategy I guess uh, <clears throat> first question um, with uh, when when a bond is coming up to a day when it can be called is the price paid on uh, on the call date the face value or is it the current capital value of that bond and my second question uh, is in relation to uh, inflation linked bonds. Um, I currently, um, I'm invested mainly in the equity market. Uh, I'm coming up to retirement age. I'm transitioning into, uh, into bonds for some of my investment. Um, should I be looking at inflation, uh, inflation linked bonds at this point? I read a lot about uh, the potential for uh, there to be a bit of a bond bubble at the moment and that inflation could be coming up. How should, how should that be viewed? What, what should be the strategy of, uh, of looking at the merits of uh, fixed income bonds and inflation linked bonds? Great questions, Carl. I, um, I missed the first question because the volume was too loud and it was all distorted. But can I talk about the second part? Sure. It's an excellent, it's an excellent question. S baby boomers now are moving towards retirement. The biggest bulge that we've seen in Australia's history in so. terms of the population and the cohort are now retiring. The big issue is that the, the, the most common advice that they receive 
is when you retire, you need income. So therefore, switch out of equities and growth assets and go into uh, income assets, so typically bonds. Um, the problem with that, of course, is, is that it is inflation. And so if you're on a fixed rate, and I'm not talking about floating rate notes here, but if you're on a fixed rate of income, then it's very likely that within 10 to 15 years, and you will live more than likely 20 to 30 years after you retire, um, 10 to 15 years, your purchasing power is gone. Uh, and so you need to have that growth even when you've retired. And, and a lot of advice that's going around is that you don't. You need safety and you need income. And, and I yeah. think there needs to be a balance in that advice. Yeah, I, I, I just I, I, warn I, investors about um, fixed interest, you know, just vanilla treasury, you know, government bonds. Um, because if we all nodded off today and woke up in 10 to 15 years' time, my very, I think, I think arguable guess, and I think it is a guess, but I reckon we'll wake up and interest rates will be significantly higher than where they are today. If you go back 100 years, you'll see there's a definite cycle in these things. Mm, yeah. um, and, and we're at a low. And the next 10 or 15 years, we wake up, we'll see interest rates a lot higher. So you yeah, have to be very, fine. very careful. Uh, gentlemen, we have a caller, Harry from Melbourne. Hello, Harry, how are you? Hi, how are you? Question for Roger. Um, Roger, I was fortunate enough to pull out of the equity markets in 2006. And thank good that, that I did, because obviously the GFC and the collapse in the stock market would have, um, you know, would have probably halved my portfolio. I'm in a fortunate position at the moment where I've got cash at bank, and obviously with low um, interest rates, I'm not too um, happy about that. My fear is the following, that if I do get into quality companies in the equity markets, what happens if there's a GFC too, and again, the market collapses? Sure. Well, what happens is the value of your portfolio goes down a lot. Um, but the reality is that unlike that period, and, and I'm, I'm saying this with some confidence because prior to the GFC, um, uh, six months prior to the GFC, I sold my funds management business uh, and, and I remember doing a presentation with Bob Gottliebson and saying to our clients at the time that you're going to wake up sometime next year and the Dow Jones will be down a thousand points. I don't see that happening right now. There may be a five or seven percent correction in the market. That's quite possible, but I think that's normal, and uh, and you should you should expect that. But see volatility as an opportunity rather than risk. The reality is right now, though, there isn't a great deal of value. Uh, we've made a lot of money recently out of internet stocks, for example, the Seeks, the car sales, uh, the real estate uh, <laughs> dot com type businesses. Uh, and, um, and, and we're in the process now of reappraising our holdings in those companies simply because they're very, they appear to be much more expensive. Um, their growth is excellent, um, but the price is, they're priced for perfection. So I would caution you to rush straight into the market. You need to find not only good quality businesses, but they need to be cheap as well. And right now, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of value. But that's not to say the market's expensive either. I think most companies have basically reached their value. We need to see how this earnings season goes before we decide whether or not value increases and value appears again, um, or whether or not things have got ahead of themselves and we get a correction. Great question. Um, we now have Eric from Sydney who's got a question on volatility. Hello, Eric. How are you? Y yes, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Look, uh, thank God uh, Roger's on the program. Look, uh, what should be done? Is you had the graph of the volatility of shares. I have done also a graph of dividends per shares on certain stocks like ARB and the Commonwealth Bank, Coca-Cola, Woolworth, CSL, all the other stocks that I own. It's a linear type of graph with dividends per share increasing over the years. Maybe you could get a graph of ARB Corporation for the last 12 years. Get it up and, and we'll see you know, the dividends. Uh, thing. I would also say Harry is a victim of the great safety bubble. Thank you. Um, er Eric, can I just comment? Eric, I, I don't need to see the graph of ARB. We own it. Um, and the companies that you listed make up a brilliant portfolio of A1 businesses in Australia. Um, so you've done very, very well. Your volatility is lower than the overall market. You've picked out of all the banks, you've picked CBA, which is the best performing bank in terms of business performance. Um, so well done. Uh, take this, we'll take your statement as read. I, um, I'm actually concerned about something quite specific. Um, I'm concerned, and this is the only thing that keeps me awake at night. I had breakfast last year with Andrew Robb, who's the yep. um, shadow minister for everything, including debt reduction. Yep. Um, and grumpiness. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I'm very concerned that the Liberal Party gets up and it's going to be more of the same. Um, that's not to say I'm voting Labor or Liberal. I'm not you know, divulging that. But, um, but I'm very concerned uh, that they're going, to, they're going to come out with a pitch where Australia needs to play to its strengths. 
and what are our strengths? Agriculture and resources. And the reality is those two exports aren't valued very highly globally, right? Nobody cares about what brand of iron ore they get. And if you look at our biggest company in Australia, we've got you know, BHP, you compare that to the biggest company in the United States, you know, it's, either, it's either Chevron or, it's, uh, or Apple. Um, and in the case of Apple, you know, they're producing a high value added product. We're not doing that in Australia. We aren't producing high value added products. What's the impact of that? The impact of that is we've got a balance of payments deficit. And we haven't got a balance of payments deficit that's permanent. The government will tell you that it's permanent, it's structural, and there's nothing we can do yeah. about it. The reason why we've got it, we've got it because the value of our exports is lower than the value of our imports. We're exporting raw materials and we're importing high value added products. What we need to do is we need to incentivise manufacturing in Australia and that isn't happening. We're not getting it. So what happens as a result? You've got a balance of payments. Sorry, just let me finish. I'm on my sure. soapbox now. Thank you. But you've got a balance of payments um, deficit. You need a car in the current account, you've got a balance of payments, you need to have a surplus in your capital account. So then the government tells us that we need to have foreign investment in Australia to support our balance of payments deficit in the current account. And what do they do? Foreign investors buy our businesses, they buy our farms, they buy our resources. And we need that to support our spending. If we could add value to our exports, then we would be in a situation where we wouldn't require, we wouldn't be selling off the farm. And that's what keeps me awake at night, that nothing's going to change. See, see, so just on the productivity thing, sorry, Mark, you, you can't, I'll, I'll you can't have debt soon. rising faster than income. Mm. You can't have income rising faster than productivity. Mm. So you need to lift productivity to lift income. Mm. And if you lift income, then you can borrow more and the credit cycle off it goes, you, know, you get growth. And, and that's what we need. Um, but it isn't necessarily industrial reform. What we need is manufacturing. We need to make stuff and add mm. value to stuff that the rest of the world wants. Yeah. And if we increase the value of what we export, then we won't need the foreign inflows. We'll actually go out and buy assets overseas. Absolutely. We have David from Sydney who would like to talk to us about reinvesting profits. That, that'll be a question for you, I'm sure. David, what would you like to talk about? Oh, hi there, team. What a fabulous panel. Um, look, the, the issue I face is uh, that I actually stayed in the market um, from June last year um, and I've now got a very substantial gain at being sort of, you know, close to sort of 30 or 40 per cent and I can see the market pushing towards 5,000 and I think the time has come to probably seriously take some of that off the table. So how would the team recommend I approach that issue and what would they recommend I do with you know, a significant sum of money, probably sort of, you know, the order of 300000 in profit over the last six months. I'd love to hear your answers to that. Uh, I actually believe that you shouldn't use price uh, as your trigger for what to do. So the first thing, that, one of the things you said was that price has gone up 30 or 40 per cent, so now you think that you should take some money off the table. It isn't always the case that if you make 30 per cent, it's going to go down. Um, so don't use price as your trigger. You've got to look at valuations. Can I plug the blog? Because we talk about this as an article on the blog. Is that blog right? On. So if you go to rogermontgomery.com, there's a little article where I talk about valuations in the Australian market. Just type in valuation into the search function and you'll see there's a couple of articles that pop up and I talk about this very question. But you've got to look at the value of the market, not the price. And if the market's gone up, if your assets have gone up 30 or 40 percent, the stocks have gone up 30 or 40 percent, if the value of those stocks have gone up by more, they're still cheap. So you wouldn't be selling them. So you've got to look at values. But it's also the utility. It's also the, the effect of the profit. It, it's your behaviour as well. So you, I think it's going to go another 30 percent, but I don't really want to be in for that ride. It's, it's a question of I'd like to have some sleep money. So I might put, if I had 300, I might put 100 away and, and bank yeah. that 100 into something that I'm able to say that that's a safety trade and I might miss a one third of the movement but at the same time I, I'm okay with that sort of movement. I, I think that's true but if you don't know the value, if you don't want something, mm. if you know what something's actually worth you're flying blind, you're Couldn't just agree. taking a guess. Uh, you're absolutely. Speculating. So what, what do you do if you don't know the value? Get it. Sorry? Calculate it. There's, okay. a, for, there's a little formula for it. Gotcha. Yeah. And a lot of people are looking for new formulas, aren't they? Like yeah, look, it's a really simple one. Return on equity divided by required return multiplied by equity per share. For a business like Telstra that pays 100% of its earnings out as a dividend, that's, that's the formula. That's the basic formula. Yeah, right. ROE divided by RR multiplied by equity per share. That'll give you an estimate. Right, we're going to have another round two of the speed clock, so we will go to a break. But before we do that, we've Roger for 30 seconds. You know the questions. It's cash, it's currency, it's Dow, and it's the bonds. Okay, so... Uh, Leading with you, one second, we need that 30 seconds, don't jump early there. Now. 
Okay, so in terms of cash, I actually think cash we're going to end up at, uh, in a year's time basically where we are, give or take half a percent. Uh, in terms of bonds, I think we're going to see prices fall and yields higher. In terms of the All Ordinaries Index, I think we'll see the All Ordinaries Index higher in a year's time. And what was the final asset? Was it the currency? I think currency. the uh, Aussie dollar could actually fall a lot if we see foreign investment start to pull back, especially from China. So uh, I'm actually hedging the Aussie dollar and buying US dollars and Swiss francs. Swiss francs, that's a big call. What, what's supporting our currency is foreign investment. Yep. And, uh, and if that turns backwards, then we've got a balance of payments, current account deficit, and then we'll have a huge problem a huge problem on the capital account as well. But just in, just based on that point, the countries that I've got here that have um, low debt, strong growth, um, strong trade balances, um, decent interest rates, there's, it's Norway, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland and Sweden. Mm. So there's not a lot. There's not and, a lot to And there's from. a lot of money that sits on the sideline listening to people like Gross and, it, and it's constantly coming through where you see global markets buying the Australian government debt and everyone says, why would you buy something with a 3% or a 2.5% handle? Well, the very reason is everything else is so toxic. Yeah, that's right. You know, you, you need to put your money somewhere. The other point that he, he's actually made is investing global equities with stable cash flows should provide historically lower but relatively attractive returns. That's the four majors, that's Telstra. So we see Cal Telstra so at 460-something, four, 62, 3. And we think that's priced in, and I couldn't agree more. Let's, but, but let's not kid ourselves. In a high inflation environment, the 1970s is a classic example, you couldn't, the only place you could protect yourself um, from a loss of capital was, inflation, uh, was cash. Yeah. You still lost purchasing power in cash, but you didn't lose capital. Uh, you know, one of the things that would come out of this conversation, I think the viewers at home should look at it, is that it is quite complex, it is quite interesting, and it becomes quite risky if you don't know what you're doing. And one of the things that stood out, I was reading... Uh, so one call of the, us, is that what you're saying? Not yet. I'm not saying that yet. <laughs> one of the things that stood out to me was I was reading one of the trade mags. Self-managed super funds have the highest growth in five years. Yeah. And so in terms I looked of at inflows this, or in terms, in terms of asset of, appreciation? No, in t no, no, in terms of creation. Okay. The number oh, of so there's now 488,566 okay. at the end of 2012. Okay, so there's a life cycle. There's a big life where, cycle in. So what typically happens, someone retires... I haven't finished my question. Oh, sorry, there's a question. The question, is, know, this. A the question is this. With that evolution, that growth in those self-managed super funds, what are you concerned about for those people who were yeah. self-managed super funds start at 60, 50, whatever they're doing, and they're working as engineers, nurses, doctors, and all of a sudden turning around and saying, I want to buy an equity or I want to buy a bond. What are your concerns for the, this volume of people? Well, people have, people have become, you know, I see it, with, I see it mostly with doctors and dentists. You know, they spend a, 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 a dozen years at university become a specialist and become expert at what they do and then they think well if I read a book on trading shares I'm going to be an expert share trader you know and it, it doesn't work out that way but typically what happens is somebody retires they believe and rightly that no one's going to care about their money more than them and that's absolutely, absolutely right yeah, that's um, uh, and then they they start managing their money and some of them do very well out of it and unfortunately some don't but eventually what happens is they near 70 years of age most people start saying you know what I want to spend more time with my kids I, I realise there's no point in being rich if I'm changed to a computer uh, and so they hand it to experts to manage. But they spend most of their time trying to find out who those experts the, are. You know, in 20 seconds each, um, I suppose I, the question is, are we going to take greater risk over the course of the year? Are these 500,000 funds going to go for greater risk over the course of this year? So we'll start with you, Roger. So, look, I believe that, I, I actually believe that um, they will. Uh, and the pressure to move into equities will grow uh, as yields fail to actually increase in the cash rate. Um, so that'll be right. But unfortunately, the higher they push up equities that may be already overvalued, um, the more risk they're taking on uh, and the more risk of higher volatility and capital loss. So they absolutely have to be disciplined and look for good value.